This afternoon, we've been joined by colleagues from the UK Hydrographic Office. And please, could you tell me your names and job titles? Hello, my name is Katrina Board. I'm a project manager specialising in the technology area of the business. And I'm currently a STEM ambassador representing the United Kingdom Hydrographic Office. Hi, my name is Mike Hudgel. I'm a data scientist. Um, I was one of the people that set the, uh, the team up. We've been going for about three years now. Hi there, I'm Jan Fisher and I'm the Head of Technical Systems of the UK Hydrographic Office. Uh, and we've recently completed a project to migrate our entire data centre from our old building to our new building. Nina, please could you give us an outline of what the UK Hydrographic Office does? Yes, of course. I've been at the Hydrographic Office since 2007 and have seen many changes in policy, strategy and growth within the business. The United Kingdom Hydrographic Office is a trading fund of the Ministry of Defence. This allows us to operate as a self-funded organisation at no additional expense to the taxpayer. Supporting safety, safe navigation across the globe is at the heart of what we do often referred to as SOLAS, Safety of Life at Sea. For over 220 years, we've been producing world-leading charts and publications to protect ships, crew and cargo. In fact, our portfolio of Admiralty Maritime Data Solutions is found on over 90% of shipping internationally. In addition to all UK defence vessels, from ships to uh, submarines, they rely on our navigational and operational products and services. We work very closely with the Royal Navy and other defence customers to develop and deliver specialist navigational products to support national defence and security. The United Kingdom Hydrographic Office is a world leading centre for hydrography, specialising in marine geospatial data that helps others to unlock a deeper understanding of the world's oceans. Working with a wide range of partners, we source, process and provide access to this data, ranging from seabed to surface. In addition to hydrography, we provide specialist advice to government across a range of disciplines. These include oceanography, marine cartography, astronomy and law of the sea. And we help represent the UK as experts in these fields. We also support the blue economy, growth by undertaking seabed mapping, analysing marine data and producing up-to-date nautical charts. Not only does this support safe navigation worldwide, but it can also inform environmental protection, resilience against the effects of climate change and disaster relief efforts. Thank you, Katrina. That's very comprehensive. And um, Michael, how is the UK Hydrographic Office applying machine learning and artificial intelligence in this range of tasks? Okay, well, in terms of uh, machine learning, of uh, what uh, sort of data science techniques give us is the ability to automate uh, tasks. And automation is kind of a, a, a huge kind of area for um, office kind of based work. So where we've currently got analysts kind of pouring over data, it might be data from satellites or uh, bathymetry data from uh, surveys. Um, what we can do is kind of automate the tasks the humans are currently doing. Um, not, not to kind of put people out of work, but it means that we can actually cover much bigger areas much more economically. And then the people that are currently doing the, the, the complete job um, tend then to that their job kind of morphs into making sure the, the machine learning uh, is actually doing the right thing. So they, they all, everybody becomes a supervisor of some automated kind of routine. Uh, so we've uh, created lots of models in the last three years. Uh, we were able to automatically detect uh, kind of mangrove forests from satellite images, uh, offshore infrastructure from synthetic aperture radar, um, and we're also looking at kind of oceanographic data uh, for other parts of the business as well. In terms of uh, artificial intelligence, uh, the, the, the real interest for us here is around autonomous navigation. So at the moment, the ships are crewed by um, uh, people, uh, and we think in the decades to come uh, that that will change. 
Um, so it's not just sort of driverless cars. We, we think that the whole sort of maritime industry is going to change and essentially there will be no crews in, in the de decades to come. So one aspect of that is actually ships will start looking very different. Uh, the design of ships is around the, the crew and the cargo. Uh, so, so expect to see kind of very odd kind of shaped ships where maybe uh, you don't necessarily need uh, uh, a superstructure and the ship to actually be upright. Um, it, it might be more of a kind of cigar tube going forward. Um, of course, that's kind of a, a little way down the road. What we're already seeing though is uh, kind of human in the loop AI, so not a complete replacement. Uh, but we, uh, with, with other kind of things that are happening around um, augmented reality, we're seeing um, data displayed on the windows of a bridge, actually giving uh, the bridge crew uh, the, the, the course, the heading, the speed of ships that they can see out the window. And maybe there's a model there predicting risk to, to their own vessel, given that information. So hugely exciting, uh, very interesting times that we live in. And with such a vast amount of data to manage, what are the key factors in ensuring robust data center operations, Jan? So um, there's a number of things that we always have to think about. Um, with the modern world, uh, a lot of data is moving into, into the cloud. Um, big cloud providers like uh, Amazon and Microsoft um, give us vast uh, arrays of, of storage capabilities. But for our data centers on site, we have to think about availability. Uh, and for us, that generally means ensuring that we have redundancy and resilience in all the systems that we build. So we need to make sure that we have um, redundant power supply mechanisms. So sometimes that includes backup generators to ensure that if there's a, a power failure within the, the area, the data center will continue to run. It means that we need to consider things like cooling. So we have air conditioning to make sure the servers don't overheat. Um, we have to factor in resilience in that so that if an air conditioning unit fails, we still have sufficient air conditioning capability to maintain the temperature so that the servers don't overheat. So from a physical element, that sort of covers um, the, the basic part, but then really the, the important assets that we have as a business is, is as you say, our data. And really for, for robust data center operations, we have to ensure that that data is available in the event of a disaster. So we copy that data to alternative sites to make sure that we have that backup. Uh, and depending on the type of data, um, we either back it up to local um, mediums, perhaps tapes, or these days we often use um, storage arrays, uh, or sometimes we, we put it up in the cloud as well to make sure that whatever happens, we always have that data available uh, and ready to use. Thank you, Jan. Um, Michael, you've already outlined some of the exciting developments you can see in your work areas. Are there any more? Oh, abs absolutely. Uh, the, the one thing we haven't mentioned is that the, <clears throat> the, the, the notion of big data. So um, we're actually just seeing this such a, a huge increase in the amount of data that's generated that we can then use within data science. Uh, one of the interesting things about sort of big data is we, we're actually using data for purposes other than it was originally intended. So there's a, there's a huge uh, area uh, for uh, exploitation there. Uh, I, I guess for me, it's all about drones. So we're actually starting to see, in fact, I processed a bathymetric survey that's, that's come from an autonomous vessel. So we haven't had people out there uh, with an echo sounder. It, it's actually a boat that's gone out and it's, uh, on its own. So we'll be able to kind of map the, the, the world's oceans much more cheaply again. Um, and, and it's not just the collection that will be cheaper with drones. Uh, it will be the, the automated processes that can actually uh, clean that data and, and produce the products that we, that we need to go forward. Thank you. And Jan, what technical skills and personal attributes would you look for in new team members? It's a difficult one, that one, because there's such uh, a wide array of technical um, pieces of software and hardware in use with us. But really, um, Microsoft is, is at the core of a lot of what we do. So for, for my team, we focus on having um, a, a broad depth of skills in the Microsoft server environment. Um, but people also need to understand the networking and how that all hangs together. Um, and in terms of personal skills, it, it's 
it's important that people are able to um, think logically, to be able to troubleshoot sometimes complex problems within uh, multiple different uh, environments, uh, and also to, to not panic under stress. When there's sometimes outages or problems with services, uh, it can sometimes be quite a high pressure environment uh, with lots of people waiting for you to fix something. So it's important to be able to remain calm and try and think logically. Thank you, Jan. And Michael, do you have a task that um, students could try at home related to your work? Okay, well, I mean, the skills needed in data science uh, in priority order, if you like, are coding and then maths and statistics. Um, so my task is around <clears throat> if, if the students haven't got a GitHub account, it's to go and set one of those up. They're not kind of fluent with the Python programming language. Uh, there are lots of really good free online courses for that. But the actual task is to sign up to a data science community called Kaggle and actually have a go at the uh, Titanic competition. Now, the Titanic competition uh, basically gives you the passenger list from the manifest of the Titanic, and you have to build a model to work out uh, if each individual is going to survive or not. So a little bit morbid, but it's, it's a lovely introduction to a classification problem. Um, and the good thing about Kaggle, it's a community, so there's, there's lots of sample code and sample models that people can just play with and, and experiment with. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. And Jan, would you similarly have a task for students? Sure. So historically, creating a web server uh, would be quite a complex process. And um, these days, with the advent of cloud technologies, it can be achieved extremely simply. So my task is for students to sign up to a cloud provider I would suggest perhaps AWS and to use a simple storage account. Uh, AWS offer a, a storage mechanism called S3 to create an extremely simple web server uh, that simply displays a message and see how easy it is these days. Brilliant. Well, thank you all three of you. It's a really clear overview of what the UK Hydrographic Office does and the types of roles that are available there locally in Somerset. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.